CBT oil. Nothing personal word of the day. Welcome to Monday, December 14th, 2020. CBT oil is the uh, type of oil that you can use. It doesn't have the THC in it. And going through the show with Coca, he said, you know, Samson, it's CBD. And I said, no, no, it's CDT, like the convention development tax used to fund ballparks in Florida, CDT. No, no, David, it's the CBT. No, no, that's what I said. He said it's CBD. I said, I'm not talking about the gummies. I'm talking about the Cleveland Indians. Word of the day is CBT. The Cleveland baseball team, it's happened. Let's talk about it. So about 110 years ago, maybe a little more, the Cleveland Indians were born and they've been the Cleveland Indians ever since. They had a mascot named Chief Wahoo, became famous in the movie Major League. There was always a racist underpinning. That's just the bottom line. But by the way, there's racism all over sports. When you look at the name, I was just talking to Coco. We were doing the pregame, the Dallas Cowboys and the Cleveland Indians talking about playing Cowboys and Indians as a kid. The Cowboys always got the Indians. You never wanted to be the Indian. You wanted to be the Cowboy. No wonder the Cowboys are America's team and the Indians were the laughable, lovable losers. They have never won the World Series. I don't know if it's a never, Coca, but certainly not since I've been around. They made it to the World Series. Marlins beat them in 97. They had a great team with Albert Bell. James Lofton, except it's Kenny Lofton. James Lofton plays football. CC Sabathi was on that team, who's now in media, by the way. Welcome to media. There is life after baseball, CC. So the Cleveland Indians knew that their name was an issue. As a matter of fact, when we'd go to Cleveland, there were always protesters, Native Americans protesting. Never meant a thing. Never meant a thing. And then 2020 happened. Why is it that 2020, forget COVID, it's been the moment of racial reckoning? Are people more racist now than they were 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago? What made this year be the change? What made this year cause owners to pretend that they changed their mind. Daniel Snyder of the Washington Redskins said, I can't do it anymore. We're gonna change our name. We're not gonna be the Redskins anymore. We've covered it quite a bit on Nothing Personal and I explained to you, well, listen, here's what happened there. When the sponsors say no mas, no more money, there's a breaking point. When all of the protests and demonstrations and everything that's gone on in sports that you know about during 2020. The owner of the Indians, who's a good guy named Paul Dolan, he said, you know what? We're going to take a look. We're going to convene a committee. It's my favorite thing when people say they're going to convene a committee because all that means is that what they're doing is providing cover for a decision that they're going to decide whether or not to make or not make. But they've got the committee having been convened to inform the public what they discovered. Yet every committee I've seen discovers exactly what the committee former tells them to find. So in Cleveland, they're gonna convene a committee to study the name. (laughs) What the hell do you need to study? We're gonna convene a committee to try to speak to everybody who has a vested interest in this. What does that mean? Makes me smile. The Native American population simply wants to be viewed as a population that has been wronged historically, does not want to be made fun of and mocked. There's no difference in their mind between dressing up in blackface and dressing up in Indian face. Both used to be acceptable. Dressing in blackface is not acceptable. As a matter of fact, people are going back in time and looking at old posts. You were in blackface 25 years ago. So, of course, you don't need to convene a committee to understand that which Native Americans want. What the Dolan family really meant is they're going to speak to their sponsors. They're going to speak to a few key stakeholders in the community, a few politicians, as they get ready to need more public money for their ballpark, which is not young anymore. 
and they were going to decide, is this the moment? Do I have no other choice? And then they're going to come out and say, we have studied this. We have been very aware of the connotation of our name. And we agree it's time to change. And it made me snicker with a unhealthy level of cynicism because Paul Dolan did not discover just now that his name, his teen name was racist. He didn't have an epiphany saying, oh, it's 2020, I see the light. Todd Rundgren did not happen. That's a Todd Rundgren song, I Saw the Light. Do you know my Todd Rundgren story, Coca? I think you do. But Paul Dolan said to us yesterday, we've come to a conclusion. We are changing the name. And it was a rumor, of course. It's a source without permission to talk. Every time you read an article, it says a source who does not have the authority to discuss the subject. So he remains anonymous. By definition, if you have authority to discuss the subject, does that mean you don't have to be anonymous? You can put your name to it? I think it's the opposite. I've got authority to discuss the subject because I know the answer. To me, what gives me authority to talk is not guessing, it's knowledge. So when I was with the Marlins, I would never be one of those sources without authority to talk, without authority to disclose information. That's what it would say. I have the authority to disclose it. I was in the room. I made the decision along with the owner. I promise you this is the case. So with the Cleveland Indians, it's 100% happening. They are changing their name. Now, what's going to happen? What will the announcement be? Everyone, let's get up on CBS and do breaking news. Is it the Cleveland Spiders? Is it the Cleveland Rockers? Is it the Cleveland Rock and Rollers? Is it the Cleveland LeBrons? I heard that one. That's a good one. I think it should be the Cleveland James. What could it be? It's going to be the Cleveland baseball team, of course. That makes perfect sense. The Washington Redskins are the Washington football team, not because they want to be the Washington football team, because there was no time before the season to come up with a name, to pretend the public had a say in the name, to get uniforms designed, to get uniforms made, to get uniforms out in the public, get ready for sold, to be sold, get the new logo out to all the places that use logos. Do you know there's still some websites and some places that are using the old Marlins logo? And Derek Jeter changed that logo years ago. It takes time. So when the Indians said that they're going to get rid of the name Indian and they're saying they don't have time to do it before the 2021 season because the committee that was convened had not come to a conclusion yet, they're full of it. They should have known that that name should have been changed a decade ago. They didn't want it to. Five years ago, no need. One year ago, ah, we'll study it. Maybe this will go away like all the other times people lost their minds about our name. Maybe it'll go away. Maybe 2020 won't go away. Maybe the only thing that will go away from this year is COVID and all of the other correctness, which is, I, I don't want to use that word, Coca, take it out. It's not correctness. It's people acknowledging that racial cleansing and that being racist, it's not that it's not cool. It's not that it's anything other than stupid. I want to judge people based on intelligence, not color. I want to judge people based on whether or not they are productive. I don't want to judge people based on race. I don't want to, I don't want to be negative toward a group of people because, because they're Indians, because they're Jews, or because they're black. It, it makes no sense to me. I never, you've heard me on nothing personal. Racism just does not make sense to me. It's born of insecurity. It's born of fear. It's born of power. It's nice when you play Cowboys and Indians. What was the whole point when you did that? It was the power you felt as a Cowboy. No one wants to be the Indian. How about Tonto? Remember that? It was uh, the Lone Ranger and Tonto, the great assistant with the feather in his cap. So the Indians are going to get together right now, and they're going to meet with fans, and they're going to give fans an opportunity. We used to do this with our logo. Whenever we change a logo, whenever we make a decision, we'd say we're getting fan input which means we'd open an email site and you'd get to submit your suggestions for X or Y. Give us your suggestion for a type of food you want in the concession stands. Give us a suggestion for what we can do better. It's the old suggestion box. And generally, 
paper that's put in a suggestion box is used as toilet paper by the people who open the suggestion box. Generally, what a team will do is they will choose what they want and then they will find a fan who either agrees, who had a similar idea. They'll speak to the fan and say, hey, here's the name. We're going to say that you were a part of it. We'll give you a bunch of free stuff. You say to the fan, oh, you wanted the Cleveland Rockies? Well, it's actually going to be, what do you think of the Cleveland Rockers? Oh, you like that? All right. We had a fan who liked the Cleveland Rockers. There's a lot of ways to manipulate it, but there's no time. So look for the Indians to be renamed CBT this year and realize that this is just the beginning. The Atlanta Braves have to get rid of the chop. Jerry Reinsdorf in Chicago does not own the Blackhawks, so stop getting upset with Reinsdorf over the Blackhawks. It's the Wirtz family. The Blackhawks will eventually have to change, even though they said they wouldn't. Nicknames will be changed throughout sports because I believe 2020 is the beginning, not the end, not another moment of time that will be ignored. This will not go away. Team by team will realize that it is not tenable any longer to continue down their historical path of power and racism. The Indians are no more. By the way, for all of people, please, For people saying that there's going to be a group of people unhappy with this, if you are one of the people who's an Indians fan, and I know a lot of Indians fans, and you will not be a fan of your hometown team because they've changed their nickname, guess what? You're just not a fan. All right, we got Christmas coming up. We are 11 days. Is that a song, the 11 days of Christmas? What do they do? What's like the countdown, Coca? Do you have any idea what it is? I don't even know if our document's working right now because there's been a total shutdown. We are so dependent on docs and email and Google. And when it goes down, it's like a panic. Oh my God, Twitter's down. I can't get emails. I can't get the latest BOGO from Walgreens or the latest suggestion from Amazon. God, they are so good in their algorithms. It's amazing. So I think there's a Christmas song. It's the 12 days of Christmas. Thank you, Coca. Welcome to the show. It's Monday morning. Coca always joins about 10 minutes in on Mondays. And on Fridays, he leaves 30 minutes early. So there was a, uh, there's a thing called Secret Santa. Secret Santa is when you exchange presents and you know who you have. You don't know who has you. You put a limit on the amount of money you can spend. And then you do an exchange. And maybe you do it via Zoom this year. But in other times, in vaccinated times, you get together and you exchange gifts. It's called Secret Santa. Well, Johnny Bench's Secret Santa is a guy named Alan Horwitz, except he's not so secret because it all went public. Here's the story, and it brings up a pretty interesting conversation about memorabilia. The memorabilia business is a huge business, a multi-billion dollar business. OJ Simpson went to jail trying to get back some of his memorabilia. You see that People sell some of their memorabilia when they run out of money later in life. Johnny Bench, part of the big red machine in Cincinnati, the best catcher in the history of baseball. He's 73 years old. I was lucky enough to meet him at the Hall of Fame when Andre Dawson got elected into the Hall of Fame in 2010. And he had uh, young kids in strollers. And I remember remarking to myself, wow, I really would not like to have young kids in strollers at that moment. And I was young 10 years ago. I was 41 years old. And it was 11 years ago, 10 years ago. So I was 42. And uh, Johnny Bench was remarried and had little kids. And I said, well, that doesn't seem like a good plan. But he was all into it. And we had a nice, funny conversation. I think he was having a drink. We had a drink together. And he had like a stroller nearby, which made me laugh. Well, he decided in order to pay Players of that generation did not make life-changing money by any stretch. So they make money with signings. They do deals where they sign autographs. People make fun of Pete Rose in Vegas doing autograph signings. But as long as people pay to get your autograph, why wouldn't you do it? It's like an artist. Do you make fun of an artist for creating a new canvas? You've got enough money. Andy Warhol, Jackson Pollock. Leger, Picasso, anybody. You've got enough money. Don't make more art. 
if I could sign my name and have people pay me to sign my name, why wouldn't I do it? So Johnny Bench has all sorts of things. He has MVP trophies, he has World Series rings, and he wanted to raise money for his kids' college tuition. He's got two little boys, I think. I don't know if they're twins, I don't know what they are. And it went to auction, and Alan Horowitz spent over a million dollars buying a bunch of Johnny Bench's memorabilia and then made an announcement that he bought it to return it to Johnny Bench. Puts a tear in my eye. I've been friends with Johnny Bench, he said, for 50 years. I went to spring training with him. Our kids know each other, and I'm a lucky person financially, so I wanted to give him back his stuff. So everyone is all excited that Alan did that, and it's actually very nice that he did it, but let's talk about a few practical things that were not in the article, just so you have an idea. If Alan Horowitz spends a million dollars buying stuff and then gives it to Johnny Bench, that's a gift. And Alan Horowitz would have to pay gift tax. You cannot give a million dollars to somebody without paying gift tax unless you make it part of your lifetime exclusion. The lifetime gift exclusion means that in your life, you can give away, call it $10 million. I'm making up a number. You keep track of what you give and you don't have to pay gift tax. But if you've given more than that, every dollar above that, you have to pay, let's say, 50% gift tax. You have to fill out this gift tax return. Now, every year, you can give anybody $14,000 gift tax-free. You can give it to your mailman. You can give it to your child. You can give it to your parent. You can give it to your cousin. You can give it to your producer. You can give it to your producer's producer. You can give it to your producer's producer, producer. You can give it to anyone tax-free. But if you give more than that, you pay a tax. So for Alan Horowitz to give a million dollars to Johnny Bench, he would have to come up with another $500,000, but he would try to get the value of the memorabilia as low as possible, saying, I'm not giving him a million dollars worth of memorabilia. I'm giving him like 100 grand. Who the hell wants his ring or MVP trophies? The problem is he set a market for it because he just paid a million dollars for the stuff. So the IRS would say, hey, it's not what you think it's worth. It's exactly worth what you just paid for it. It's worth a million dollars. Or he could not give it to Johnny Bench and he could donate it to 501c3s, which are charities. And then you pay a million dollars for it. You donate it. You donate it at a value of a million dollars and you get to deduct it as a charitable donation. I thought that would be the smart way to do it. And then word comes out that Johnny Bench is not taking into his personal possession these items of memorabilia. Instead, Alan Horowitz is donating them to various museums around the country, Johnny Bench Museums, Reds Museums, the Hall of Fame, et cetera. So that's not exactly a secret Santa to Johnny Bench. It just means that Alan Horowitz has all this memorabilia and he is going to display it by donating it. Memorabilia is a huge market. If you're shocked by the amount, don't be. Wayne Gretzky, if you have a good rookie card, tell your parents not to throw away the cards you have. I had a ton of great baseball and basketball cards. They all got thrown away by my parents. They're gone. I, I had a Wayne Gretzky rookie card. I had a Mickey Mantle rookie card. I had a Ty Cobb rookie card. I had a Honus Wagner rookie card. I had a Michael Jordan mint rookie card, a LeBron James rookie card. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. In fact, I think I just had a bunch of Marvin Webster's and Tom Burleson's. In any case, Wayne Gretzky just had a rookie card. It sold at auction for $1.29 million, $1 million for a rookie card. Anyone out there have a Gretzky rookie card? Anyone out there who used to work for the Marlins? Anybody? Does that sound familiar? Players are very sensitive about memorabilia. Here's how we would do it every year. And it happens all the way around baseball, and it became a collective bargaining issue. And I wanted to give you a little insight into it because it, it made me fascinated. We would have signing day during spring training. That's when we would bring dozens and dozens of balls and bats and numbers. You know, when players sign jerseys, we don't actually bring them a jersey to sign. What we bring are numbers. So if it's Christian Yelich, we bring a seven. So he signs as part of his 21 is his number. So, or is it 27? 
I can't remember what his number was. Stan was 27, so he'd signed sevens. Yelich was 21, he'd signed twos. Ichiro was 51, he'd signed fives. Whatever. So there'd be a room full of stuff. We'd bring in 10 employees from the foundation and players would be asked during the course of two days to sign hundreds and hundreds of items. And eventually players would say, what are we signing all these for? Because every time I sign something, it's basically gifting someone money. And so I would meet with the players and I would explain to them, here's what all the memorabilia is for. We use some of it when people have a bad experience at the ballpark, we say, here, here's a signed ball. Hey, you have a complaint about something? Here's a signed jersey. Hey, if you want to donate, we're going to give you a signed ball. You want to buy season tickets? You can get a signed jersey. So we would use them as incentives. We would use them as sales incentives. Hey, if you sell $10,000 worth of tickets, we're going to give you a jersey. We'd say that to our employees. We would give jerseys to employees. We'd give balls to employees. Each different business unit within the Marlins would submit what they wanted in memorabilia. So corporate sales would say, we want five dozen balls because whenever we do a deal, we, whenever we're trying to pitch a deal, we include a signed ball. Whenever we host people in a suite, we leave signed items for them as takeaways. So ticket sales would want a bunch of stuff. Corporate sales, marketing, finance would take very few because they'd give it to the auditors. We would take a lot in the president's office and we would use it because every time we'd get a note, hey, any chance you can make a donation to this auction, to this charity, we would send a ball. Beth would send something. We would always do that. And my view was that for players, it wasn't taking much of their time and we were not saturating the market. I mean, for Christ's sake, if you sign 500 items, you're not saturating the market. And we knew that players had deals. Some players would fight us and not want to sign everything. Some players would claim, I've got to deal with fanatics. I can't sign this stuff, but that wasn't true. Every deal that players have with exclusive companies, there are caveats and um, what's the word? Oh my God, Coca. What's the word when you uh, withhold? You can have everything here, but that. Oh my God, Coca, come on. Damn it. It's one of the worst parts about being 52. It's not, I don't mind the age. I feel good. I feel like I look young. My word recall has gotten worse over the years. And especially in 2020, it's a carve out. It's, a, it's, it's like a, a carve out. That may be it, but it may not be. Do you know, I couldn't think of a suicide sprint the other day when you run from line to line to line to line. That, they were called suicides. What an unfortunate, ridiculous name. But I couldn't think of it. But thank you to the listeners who came up with that. By the way, thank you for listening and watching Nothing Personal. So anyway, so when, you, when players do a deal with a memorabilia company, they get a carve out. They get an exclusion that they can do these signings with teams. And I, I watched Ichiro and, and Yelly. Yelly just, Christian Yelich just posted something on, on his social media account. He was signing a bunch of bats and a bunch of hats and a bunch of helmets. And each row would come in and there'd be several of his employees and he'd sign thousands of items in a day that he had an exclusive deal to sell. He would sign bobbleheads and jerseys and bats and hats and balls, et cetera. Imagine when you're in a position where you control your income. When you're a player, it's not like you control your income. You have to be a really good player. When you're a musician, you don't control your income because you have to be a really good singer and then hope that people buy your albums. You have to hope as a player, you're good enough to be a professional and then you're signed to a long-term deal. But imagine that you create something. And this is why artists fascinate me. They create something out of nothing and that something has value. That's what signing a baseball is. It's a regular baseball. It has nothing on it. All of a sudden you sign your name to it and it's worth $59.99 or $121.99 or $259.99 or $835.42. I guess if I were a player like Wayne Gretzky, I'd always want my rookie card. I'd get like a selection. Wouldn't you, if it's a player and you know you're gonna be good, like you're the next Gretzky, like this new guy just drafted by the, uh, who had the first pick in the NHL? Was it the Rangers? 
who got this new guy who's supposed to be as good as Gretzky, as good as Messier, as good as Lemieux, but he's compared mostly to Sidney Crosby. Wouldn't you take all your rookie cards, get like a bunch of them and keep them mint condition just for a rainy day? Or is the theory that if you're that good like Gretzky, you have a lifetime worth of money, therefore you don't need to have your own rookie cards? But what if you're Johnny Bench? I think that uh, Coke is telling me, I'm not even saying that, Coca. Is that true or not? There's a David's, this can't, by the way, I don't believe you, Coca. Let me, I used to get letters when I was president of the Marlins and people would say to me that they collect business cards. And I get that because I know people who collected business cards because it used to be you'd have a Rolodex and you'd get a business card. There'd be an exchange of business cards in Japan. You had to do it with a bow. You had to do it with two hands. If you're watching this on YouTube, the way to exchange business cards in Japan is that you hold the bottom left and bottom right corner of the business card. You bow and you present your business card. And then you have a business card presented to you. Coke is saying that there's a David Sampson signed business card on eBay for $36. That is that I'm clicking it. Can I click that Coca? I'm clicking it right now. He gave me a link on the document. I'm looking. That's unbelievable. All right, let me just tell you something right now. That is a Marlins business card. That came, that, that is someone who called and sent a letter saying, hey, will you sign a business card? I collect them. I guess that person was lying because now it's being sold. $36. I think it's buy it now for 36 cents. Maybe not. You never know. I've got nothing personal stuff. Should we sign that Coca, put it on eBay? All right. Alan Horowitz, thank you for doing that for Johnny Bench. Please don't misunderstand, by the way. I was not in any way impugning what he did for Johnny Bench. I was just giving you the facts. Giving you the facts. All right. We got to talk about something that's going on on CBS Sports HQ right now. We are going to have wall-to-wall coverage of signing day. It's going to be on December 16th from 9 to 6 p.m., 24-7 24-7 is a great company, by the way. A lot of great analysts. Your top analyst from 24-7 will be leading the charge. We've got Barton Simmons. He's a yelly. Bud Elliott, Steve, Josh Moore. See where your team's class ends up in the 24-7 rankings, which is the industry standard, of course. There'll be live announcements throughout the day. There'll be flip watch, rankings, leapfrogs, and, of course, signing alerts. And we'll give you the Cornicky election night feel. You know, Cornicky, the guy who's saying the Dolphins only have a 39% chance of making the playoffs. He's the guy doing the electoral. Oh, here's a little nugget. The electoral college meets today. Today is actually the day when a new president gets elected. Shocking. CBS Sports HQ is your home for winners. Losers. Top classes. Diamonds in the rough to remember. Get on your CBS Sports app. Your connected TV. Your mobile device. We are HQ. It's December 16th, 9 to 6. We'll be right back with a review that is Viacom CBS related as well. God, we're really pimping for him, aren't we, Coca? I guess that's what you do in a contract drive. And we're going to talk a little bit of Mets again. They made a signing. They made a hire. We'll be right back. (laughs) Welcome back to Nothing Personal. Thank you for that triple dose of commercials. I had to do that live read on CBS HQ and signing day. It's a lot of pressure for a kid, isn't it? Where he's going to sign. I wonder, do they sign just at the team that gives their family the most money? Is that how they choose Coca? Where they're going to sign? I I mean, they can't admit that, right? Do they do it because they have the best chance? If you're a football player, by the way, Coca, is it football or basketball signing day that we're doing on HQ on December 16th? Football. Okay. (laughs) <laughs> Thank you, Coca. So do you think that they choose, like, who's going to give them the most money? Or do they choose where they want to be, where they're comfortable, where it's the highest ranked program? Why wouldn't everyone just go to Alabama? Or if you're a Floridian, you just go to Florida, but you don't like the coach, but then you sign with the coach, but then that coach gets fired. I, I don't know how it works. It's got to be money related, right? And then there's so much pressure on the kid. And then the kid takes a microphone. These kids are 18 for Christ's sake. Hi. I am taking my talent to the Crimson Tide. 
I guess that's what signing day is. I guess you want to be the top ranked recruiting class because then you become the top ranked football team and get to go to the college football playoffs. Okay. All right. On nothing personal, we watch movies, we watch shows. We are a Viacom CBS for now podcast. That was Kevin Nealon. Thank you. Subliminal man. Did you watch Saturday Night Live, Coca? Bruce Springsteen was the guest on Saturday Night Live. It made me so happy to see him play live. I miss concerts so much. He sang two songs from his new album. And uh, I miss you, Springsteen. I mean, not you personally. I miss your concerts. I miss how I feel for three hours during your concerts. Thank you for doing what you do at the age of 70 plus to do these concerts, by the way. And I hope you come back. So there's a new show with Brian Cranston, the guy from Breaking Bad. You've heard of him. And he's got a show called Your Honor. It's on Showtime. We are going to review the episode every Monday because they're actually not dropping as a series. You have to watch the damn thing every Sunday. So last night at 10 p.m., I watched it again, episode two. This is about a judge who was forced to make a decision of his family. His wife died, and he's got to save his son from a horrific, horrific pickle, which doesn't do justice to the word pickle. It's a nightmare of every parent. So episode two was the beginning of the unraveling of the end. What this show is going to be is nine episodes of watching Brian Cranston try to save his son, try to cover up a crime that his son committed, and watching as the cover-up becomes worse than the crime. Have you heard that story about the cover-up being worse than the crime? I don't know why people do this. Why do people do this, Coca? It doesn't exactly make sense to me. Brian Cranston plays a judge. It is a, uh, it's worth getting Showtime alone for this show, believe it or not. I'm so fascinated to watch how this unravels because I think I know how it ends. But have you ever watched a movie where you're pretty sure that it's going to end with the guy marrying the girl or the guy living with the girl happily ever after? Because it's a romantic comedy. But you're still interested to see sort of how it happens. There's, they're going to get together, then they're going to break up, and then they're going to reconcile. That's sort of the formula for romantic comedies. Well, when there's a cover-up to a crime, there's the crime, there's the cover-up, there's the unraveling of the cover-up, then there is the come-to-Jesus moment where you have to confess, and then there's the salvation. I think that's how Your Honor is going to go, but it's worth watching. Your Honor, episode two dropped last night. Episode three will be next Sunday. Viacom. CBS Showtime, they are putting out some really good product. And I'm not just saying that because there's also good products on HBO, their competitor. There's good products on Peacock. There's good products on CBS All Access. But get Showtime and watch your honor. Okay. M-E-T-S. Mets, Mets, Mets. That's the song for the Jets. I'm so pit. Coke, I'm going slightly out of order here to tell you that why would I choose the Jets plus 13 and a half? I really thought that without Greg Williams, they would band together and that Russell Wilson's been struggling a little bit and they would come in and they would find a way to get past the Seahawks and win a game or at least cover 13 and a half. I'm now 38 and 33 on my pick of the day. And what I'm most embarrassed about is that I actually thought the Jets would have a chance. They got their ass kicked. The final score, this is a real score, was 715 to three. I don't know how you lose a game like that. I'm going to try to make up for it. Tonight is a game that Coca's going to watch. Coca doesn't watch a lot of sports. He reads a lot of books, watches some movies. I don't know why he'd watch sports. It's not like we're in the sports business. We're in the entertainment business. We're in the entertainment business, Coca. We are here to entertain you. But he loves the Ravens. Ravens play the Browns. So I've got two producers who I think are the most quality in the podcast world. Mike Ryan with Levitard and Matthew Coco with me. I think they're the two best producers around. Mikey Ryan is a huge Browns fan. Matthew Coca is a huge Ravens fan. And the Browns are playing the Ravens. So I have a solution to make everybody happy. Take the Browns tonight plus three and root for the Ravens to win by one or two points. Then the Ravens win, Coca's happy. The Browns cover, you're happy, Mike because you may have bet them. But more importantly, the pick of the day will win. We're 38 and 33 now because we lost the Jets. 
We're going to take the Browns plus three against the Ravens, and we're going to watch Monday Night Football tonight. Okay, J-E-T-S, Jets, 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 M-E-T-S, Mets, Mets, Mets. The Mets are in business, folks. Now batting fifth, catching number 40, James McCann. Who? James McCann has done a great job with PR this offseason. He's coming off two good years with the Chicago White Sox. He was basically a non-tender candidate with the Tigers a few years ago. And now he's got a Carl Pavano-like contract. $40 million over four years from the Mets. Here's what my imitation of James McCann, the moment Steve Cohn bought the Mets. Oh, praise God. Thank you so much. Oh, God, I can't believe Steve Cohn needs a catcher. Please get rid of Wilson Ramos, please. And you're not going to get JT Relamuto because you know you're going to want Springer instead, and I'm going to be perfect for you. And I'm going to ask for an extra year because I don't even deserve three, but I'm going to get four from you because you're so desperate. I'm going to try to get $10 million a year, but there's no chance of that because $10 million for a catcher, I've only been good two years, but shh, don't tell the new owner. Don't tell him. I think they're – hold on, it's them on the other phone. Uh, Sandy? Yeah, it's James. No, I don't have an agent. I'm not giving 5% away because you've got a new owner and you're desperate for a catcher. Yeah, I'm going to want five years. Five years. Oh, no, four you're offering me? All right, done. Deal. God, the Mets are desperate. The worst contract of the offseason will end up being this James McCann contract. There is nothing worse for a team than paying attention to the flavor of the moment and then overpaying for that flavor because you've got a need in that area. Trust me, I know of what I speak. When a team has a need and all of a sudden you talk yourself into the quality of the player because of the game, the year that he had, hey, he's really good at throwing out runners. We've had a problem. Our bullpen has a problem holding on runners. What a great idea. We're going to catch who throws him out. Pudge Rodriguez could not stop people from running on the Mets bullpen arms. Period. Oh, no, no one runs on James McCann. He's got a cannon. Mark my words. It's not a way to see, but mark my damn words. Just mark them. They'll still run on the Mets bullpen arms. James McCann's arm is not Hall of Fame-like. But his bat, he's a 270 hitter with slugging 600. Is that what he slugged, by the way, Coco? With an OPS of 7,022. Perfect for the Mets lineup with Alonzo and McNeil and Springer when they get him and Bauer when they get him too. Realamudo, ah, he's not that much better. We'd have to give him seven years and 25 million. This way we won't have to give McCann four years and 10 million. He slugged 536 last year in 31 games. By the way, that's, why is that good, Coca? Why did he only play 31 games? Was he hurt? What am I missing here? It was a 60-game season. You sit out maybe seven games because of exhaustion? Hmm. Previous three seasons, Coke is reminding me that he combined. In the previous three seasons, he combined. No. Coca, what? Coke is telling me 396 slugging combined in three seasons? And then all of a sudden he slugged 536? And then he got 40 million? Come on, Steve Cohn, what are you doing? And that wasn't even your worst move of the weekend. He hired a GM, not Mike Hill. He hired Jared Porter, and everyone is saying what a great guy he is. He's ready to be GM. Can I just tell you, and I tweeted this, but in case you don't have Twitter, which please get on at David P. Sampson and follow. But if you don't have Twitter, Jared Porter is Theo's guy. Theo has denied it to me and to everyone. He says, I'm crazy. You all say I'm crazy. You may be right. I may be crazy. But it just might be a lunatic that you're looking for. Turn out the lights. Theo's going to be a Met. He's going to get an ownership piece. I said that. And I've never been more sure that that deal is already in place. Theo and Jed Hoyer were a team. Jed Hoyer worked his way. Theo left. Jed Hoyer was ready to be president of baseball ops for the Cubs. Jared Porter is not ready 
to be Theo. He's not ready to be president of baseball ops, but he's ready to be the GM to Theo's president of baseball ops. Jared Porter was hired by the Mets. Theo is involved. Mark my words, folks. And it's not like I'm Dick Trace or anything. It's not like I needed breadcrumbs. Steve, just say it. Don't let Theo dictate your PR. It would be good for your team to say that you have a deal with Theo. Not that it's going to be worth it to give him an ownership piece or to pay him what you're going to have to pay him because Mike Hill would have done a better job for you at half the cost. And you wouldn't have had to deal with any of the issues. But if you know you're going this direction, why make Sandy Alderson believe that he has more power than he does? Why give Sandy Alderson this year and give Theo the off year when it's not really an off year while he doesn't have to go to the ballpark? You can just announce that Theo is coming in a year. He's going to be involved as a consultant. He wants time with his family. He wants a break. But we are putting things in position to make it happen. Why not do that? And if you're a Mets fan, you shouldn't care less about Theo, about Porter, about McCann. Focus on Springer. They need Springer far more than McCann. And you better hope that not taking JT doesn't cost him. Okay, wait to see is when we tell you something's going to happen. If it does, we'll revisit it. If it doesn't, we won't. A lot of articles today, a lot of tweets, a lot of inside information from sources, not with authority to speak, but with knowledge of the subject. Say that DJ LeMahieu and the Yankees are at least $25 million apart in their contract negotiation. How does that happen? Very easily. If he wants five years at 20 million a year, 20, 40, 60, 80, 100, that's $100 million for five years. If the Yankees want to pay him 75 million over four, they'd be $25 million apart. Now, on an annual basis, 75 times four is close to 20. 75 divided by four is one remainder three, four into 35 is eight. So it's 18 a year, 18.75 a year. You just watch my head do that math. I don't know if I'm right, but I think I am. So they may only be a million per year apart, which is completely no problem, but the extra year will kill you. So here's what happens. If you are a like me, you give in and give LeMahieu five years because you can't live without the guy. If you are disciplined and good at your job, you do not give a fifth year to LeMahieu because by definition in five years, LeMahieu will not be worth $2 million. Wait to see. The Yankees want to get him below 80. DJ wants to get to 100. DJ wants five years to get to that 100. He will settle for four years. The Yankees will go to 80 plus a few incentives. That's how I would settle this. I would choose in a negotiation to stay with four years. The Mayhew is going to stay at five. We're meeting with the agent. There's no rush. While the Mayhew went public today to say he's going to start negotiating with other teams, which, by the way, is totally normal. They all say that. There is nobody out there who is going to overpay for LeMahieu the way the, the Yankees will because the Yankees have already said he's their top priority. I don't know why you'd ever say that. No one should be your top priority because it gives them too much leverage. You can always find another player. Listen to the way they found LeMahieu. It was pure luck. They got him for two years, $24 million. Obviously, he outperformed. Obviously, he's an MVP caliber player in those previous two years. But when you're being paid $20 million a year, you better be good. So... The Yankees are going to play a game of chicken with LeMahieu and say, okay, go look. Go see if you can get your five years. I've gotten burned on that. Some players have actually gone and gotten that extra year. I've been burned on that by giving the extra year and having the player not be worth it. I've also been successful by telling the player no and having the player come back. Where this ends, wait to see. He'll sign for four years, $80 million plus a bit. The bit will be top three MVP finish. The bit, the little bit will be an incentive if he's healthy in year three or year four. They'll give him an opt out in case he gets even better and he can go and opt out and try to get more money. I don't think he'll exercise that opt out. 
but just wait to see how this happens because it starts with the little leaks to the media, the little desperation. Hey, I'm looking somewhere else. The owner reads that and says, sign him right now, give in. Nah, Steinbrenner won't do that. You know why? Say it with me right now. When it comes to free agent signings, you better not be emotional. You can call up DJ and you can thank him for his two years of service and say, listen, we're at four. We're at 80. It's just business. Come on, DJ. We love you. It's nothing personal. <laughs> 